Thank you, Sister Rudolph, for that beautiful music. And thank you also, President Bala, for that very complimentary introduction. I uh, would like to get a tape recording of that and play it as each one of those seven boys turns 13. Uh, I told you, children, that President Balaf was a very good judge of character. <laughs> I have uh, spent a lot of pleasant moments in this same auditorium that we're in today as I was here as a student. Um, I also spent some times when I was awake. Uh, I, re <laughs> I remember sitting down on about the sixth row right here uh, 15 years ago. And I was holding hands with my wife, it was before she was my wife. Uh, we left in the middle of that concert and uh, went over to the Wilkinson Center and got engaged. It was very romantic. <laughs> it was probably the smartest thing I ever did, actually, but it wasn't easy. Uh, Margaret was a very popular young lady on campus. And I'll tell you how popular she was. I saw her at a dance my first week that I was on campus, and I found out where she lived, so I went to her apartment to introduce myself. Uh, as I was walking up to the door, I noticed that there was this little ticket machine, kind of like the kind you see at Baskin Robbins, you know? <clears throat> so I, I took a ticket. Uh, apparently the landlord had placed it there to cut down on the confusion. Uh, I was about to knock on the door when another uh, fellow came out, nice looking guy, and uh, I said, say, uh, what number are you? And <laughs> he said, I'm number nine. And I looked at my ticket and it said 340. <laughs> so <laughs> it took me two and a half years uh, from that time to get, the, to get my date, uh, but I did it, and, uh, and I love her very much. She is... Uh, the mother of our children and my sweetheart and my companion. President Balif mentioned that uh, my undergraduate studies here in BYU, at BYU were in chemistry, and uh, I ended up with a PhD in business. I did have the blessing of the chemistry department to make that switch. Uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, as a senior, I needed one credit to graduate, and so I asked uh, Professor Hawkins, who was my organic professor, if I could do a special project for him, and he said yes. So I worked in the lab that was in his private office. He had a, a hood there, and uh, I set up my experiment, and it went along week after week, and uh, one day as we heated it up about as high a temperature as it ought to go to make it work, uh, he was seated at his desk grading papers, and I was working at the lab behind him, and I heard a little rumbling sound in there, and I said, you know, uh, Professor Hawkins, I think we might have a problem here. Uh, the next minute, the whole thing blew up, just this tremendous explosion, and uh, shook the walls, and people came running down the hall and stuck their, uh, stuck their head in to see what was going on, and uh, it nearly blew Professor Hawkins right out of his chair. Uh, whereupon, uh, after we cleaned up the mess, he put his arm around my shoulder and said, uh, about going into business administration, I think it's a wonderful idea. <laughs> <clears throat> That's true, that really happened. One of the great blessings of my life has been the opportunity to work with young people in the church, both as a director of the MBA program and, perhaps even more importantly, as a bishop. And I appreciate the opportunity to address a religious theme today. I'd like to talk to you about a principle that I've observed in the last few years as I have read the scriptures. I can remember being interested in the many accounts in both the Old and the New Testament that describe the plight of those with the disease of leprosy. Now, among those accounts, there are two that stand out in my mind. The first is found in the Old Testament in 2 Kings and is about Naaman, the captain of the Syrian army, who himself was a leper. You're probably familiar with the story. Naaman's wife had an Israelite handmaiden who suggested that if Naaman were to go see the prophet in Israel, he could be cured of his leprosy. So the king of Syria sent a letter to the king of Israel and uh, said, and I quote from 2 Kings uh, chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, I have herewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man doth send unto me to recover another man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. 
Well, as you can see, the king of Israel thought that this was just a sneaky way to start a fight. But Elisha, the prophet, heard about the letter and sent to the king, saying, Let him, namely Naaman, come now unto me, and he shall know there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Now you remember at this point, Elisha didn't even bother to, send, to, to come out himself. He sent a servant, and the servant told Naaman to go wash seven times in the river Jordan. Well, Naaman replied, much like many of us do when counseled by the prophet, and here I'm paraphrasing, he said, You mean I came all the way from Syria and I don't even get to see the main man? And you send out a servant who tells me to go and wash seven times in an irrigation canal? Apparently their Jordan River looked a lot like our Jordan River. Well, Naaman listened to some wise friends, as we often do, too. And humbled by the sweet spirit of the Lord, the scriptures tell us, Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Now, the second account is found in the New Testament. And incidentally, if you uh, would like to know, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story, you may wish to read the remainder of uh, the fifth chapter of Second Kings to find out what happens to the servant of Elisha. But the second account is found in the New Testament and should be equally familiar to you. Let me quote briefly from the 17th chapter of Luke, beginning with verse 12. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten who were cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Well, there are many interesting aspects to these two accounts concerning leprosy, but I would like to focus for a moment on the disease itself. One feature of leprosy that comes through clearly in the scriptures is its lack of subtlety. If you had it, everyone knew it. In fact, there was no need to ask about the condition of a hapless victim. The victim himself was required to announce in a loud voice, unclean, unclean. The second feature, and to me the more interesting, relates to a specific medical aspect of the disease. You see, leprosy causes a progressive loss of feeling in the effect, if affected parts of the body. And at some point, the disease so seriously affects the nerves that there is no longer any feeling in, say, a hand or a foot. Our immediate reaction might be that no feeling means no pain and perhaps less suffering for the victim. But you know that's not the case. Pain plays a very beneficial role in our welfare. It tells us in a loud voice, both figuratively and sometimes literally, when we place our hand on a hot stove. We know immediately if the hunting knife comes in contact with a leg or a foot. But you see, we are only warned if the nerves are sending signals. We are warned if the signals have not been blocked by a disease like leprosy. In fact, this loss of feeling is uh, the very most serious problem for someone with leprosy. The person may, for example, place their hand on a hot stove and not know it until the hand is burned so severely that it cannot be healed. Now today, we rarely see an actual case of leprosy. Indeed, most of us have never seen or heard of anyone having it. But there is a similar disease, a counterpart, if you will, an analog to leprosy that is very much with us. I speak, if you will, of a condition I would like to refer to as spiritual leprosy. The distinctive feature of spiritual leprosy, like its physical counterpart, is a progressive loss of feeling. It's a progressive loss of feeling that takes place not in our nerves but in our sensitivity to the Spirit and to its promptings. 
This progressive loss of contact with the Holy Ghost makes spiritual leprosy as threatening to our souls as physical as the physical disease is to our bodies. How do we get it? What are the causes? What uh, causes the onset of the disease? Well, spiritual leprosy, like any disease, results from a combination of an environment and a response. We create the environment any time we do something that offends the Spirit of the Lord. We've all been in such a position. It may be unkind words that we've spoken to a roommate or a spouse. It may be the R-rated movie that we've just seen, or the seedy magazine or book read, perhaps an act of dishonesty, or maybe our conduct on a date. In any case, what we've done has been wrong, and we know it often because we, quote, feel bad, unquote. That's interesting, isn't it, that we would use the same words to describe a spiritual condition that we might use to describe a physical condition. And when we say we feel bad about something, I suppose that we're experiencing a kind of spiritual pain. A very critical point in the whole issue is how we respond to that spiritual pain. As I've thought about it, there seem to be about as many different kinds of responses to spiritual pain as there are to physical pain. Sometimes we just try to ignore it and hope it will go away. Or we may simply try to relieve the symptoms without getting at the root cause. For example, for physical pain we may take aspirin, which typically doesn't solve our problem, but at least it doesn't hurt for a while. You know, my wife teases me that I <clears throat> respond in a funny way every time I feel sick. I tell her that I need exercise like basketball. Uh, and my family all know that, and my in-laws too. Uh, several weeks ago, my brother-in-law, who is a medical doctor, called. Uh, I called him actually because he was sick, and I asked him how he was feeling. And I told him uh, that uh, I had had the same thing before, and I knew just what he should do for it. And uh, so, you know, here I am telling the medical doctor <clears throat> what to do. And he said, well, oh, good, tell me what it is. And you see, I had him right there. I'd been waiting for ten years to have him ask me what to do for something. So I told him to take two gym shoes and play 30 minutes of basketball and call me in the morning. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we sometimes respond with similar physical approaches to cure the symptoms of spiritual pain. We get drunk on alcohol or high on drugs. We try to escape, to run away. In fact, the pain may be so intense at times that we contemplate suicide. Now, of course, the persistence of spiritual pain is a sure sign that there is something wrong. And the reasonable response to pain of any kind is to seek medical attention, if it's physical pain from a doctor. But what's the reasonable response to spiritual pain? Well, as students of the gospel, you and I know that it is to recognize our mistakes and with humility and sincerity to seek forgiveness. The unmistakable invitation of our Lord is found in Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30, where the Savior says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, if that were our immediate response, to go to our Heavenly Father and ask forgiveness, our spirits would be whole and in tune and free from disease. But my young brothers and sisters, when we know we've done something wrong and we delay or we fail altogether to seek forgiveness, at that point some of our spiritual nerves quit working. And when that happens, we've contracted spiritual leprosy. And the more we offend the Spirit and the longer we offend the Spirit, the worse the disease gets. The spiritual pain that's a signal to us to change our behavior is more and more blocked out until our spirits can be accosted by that red-hot fire of serious sin and we cannot know when to draw back our hand. Well, this would be a serious problem for persons of any age. Because we all need to be able to receive inspiration, there are serious challenges in life that come 
at every stage in life. But there are two reasons why this deadening of spiritual senses is such a major handicap to young people of your age. The first reason is that this is the time in your life when so many important decisions are made. Let me remind you specifically of two. First, you must choose a career. Now, a decision that will affect 40 percent of your waking hours for the next 40 years is not one to be taken lightly. And I don't mean to increase the anxiety that you probably already feel at the prospect of sorting out the answer to that problem, but the point is this is no time in your life to be without the inspiration of the Lord. Now, besides choosing a career, you must also choose a mate. And I know that some of you are already suffering from analysis paralysis over that issue. Needless to say, you need spiritual insight at this time in your life more than at any other. But there are, in addition to these two decisions, many others of importance that you will grapple with over the next years to come. What does it mean to have integrity? Am I really committed to the Church and to the gospel? Do I truly want to honor my parents? Am I willing to serve others, or would I, or would I rather be selfish with my time and my money? As you already know, the list of life's issues is long, and you will not have your problems solved at age 27 or 37 or even as old as President Balaf. <laughs> That's the second reason that you cannot allow yourself to be afflicted by the deadening of your spiritual nerve endings. Right now, as you struggle with career decisions and marriage decisions and the others I've spoken of, you are developing a pattern of decision-making, and this pattern will affect the way you make decisions for years to come. You need to practice now how to incorporate the Spirit into that decision-making process. You cannot practice well if you are handicapped by spiritual leprosy any more than you can practice football while you have a broken leg. If you would be in a position to be in tune and receive the guidance that you desire and need, your spirits must be as healthy as you can possibly make them. But it's not easy to make our spirits healthy. It's not easy to take the necessary steps. We feel embarrassed by our mistakes. We're ashamed to face our family, afraid to talk to our bishop, afraid that we'll lose his respect and perhaps fearful of the consequences. All of these feelings contribute to the continued disability of our spirits and keep us from achieving spiritual health. However, unlike our physical bodies, which are sometimes crippled and diseased beyond repair, our spirits can be healed. But the key is courage. It takes a lot of courage. We must deal with our spiritual afflictions with the same courage that we observe in those around us who have physical afflictions. And perhaps because <clears throat> the physical afflictions are so much more readily apparent, we are more alert to the courage displayed by those who do battle with them. Let me give you an example. I'll never forget uh, a man named Paul Taylor who had an office next to mine at the University of California at Berkeley. And Paul was in his 70s. And I'm convinced that he was the model for Tim Conway, uh, the comedian's portrayal of the little old man who takes such tiny, slow steps wherever he goes. Paul walked so slowly that he couldn't get out of the elevator before the door closed on him. And it was really obviously not easy for him to get around. But he came to the office every day in spite of it. And I didn't think much of it until I noticed one day that he had a Band-Aid on each eye. And one end of the Band-Aid was hooked to his eyelid, and the other end was hooked up over his eyebrow and stuck on his forehead, kind of like this, see, like that. Well, I chuckled for a minute. I thought that was pretty funny. And then I realized that without the Band-Aids, Paul's eyelids wouldn't stay open. Paul could have stayed home. At age 75, he had every right. But that wasn't getting him anywhere. You see, even though he could only take tiny little steps, with those band-aids on his eyelids, he could see, and he could move forward, 
and he could make progress. Or what about the young man that I saw one day in Berkeley as I was going into the university? I was driving along, uh, daydreaming a little about making a slam dunk over the top of Julius Irving, and uh, I was about to turn right at an intersection. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye a young man, maybe 16 or 17, was walking fast and about to cross where I was turning. He wasn't slowing down at all. And about 20 feet uh, before he got to the intersection, he went like this. Yeah! Did that scare you? It scared me. About jumped right out of my driver's seat. Well, he went right across the street without breaking stride, and I said to myself, that kid is a bona fide card-carrying crazy. There's no doubt about it. Well, I went on to work, and I didn't think much more of it. But about three or four days later, I saw that same boy again. He was in the middle of the block this time, and I slowed down to get a better look at him. You know what I realized? That boy was blind. And he also had a big Band-Aid right in the middle of his forehead, and I can imagine how it got there. Can you see the determination this young man had? He walked fast. He yelled at cars. He wasn't about to let a little thing like being blind slow him down in life. Well, the courage of Paul Taylor and the determination of that blind boy were obvious as they confronted their physical afflictions. We need that same kind of courage and determination as we grapple with our spiritual afflictions. Fortunately, none of us is ever totally blind spiritually. But maybe we have a few Band-Aids on our forehead from running into things when our spiritual eyes have been closed. We need to have the courage to put those Band-Aids on our spiritual eyelids and begin the process of healing our spirits. Let me tell you about David Brenner. David's in a wheelchair, and he has limited use of his hands as a result of a diving accident suffered many years ago. David signed up for a 400-level financial management course I was teaching during spring term about two years ago. And I remember that David, in spite of being in a wheelchair, made it to every lecture and handed in every one of his assignments, and he did very well in class. But there was one small, quiet incident that I shall never forget that left an indelible impression on my mind. For the final exam, I required that each of the students use a blue book for their answers. And I happened to look over at David just as he was attempting to turn the pages in his turn a page in his blue book so he could continue writing down the answers. Well, he struggled, and he struggled, and he struggled. And finally, after five agonizing minutes, he managed to turn one page. Now, you see, you and I would worry about the answers, about getting them right. David worried just about turning the pages. Do your spirits sometimes struggle just to turn the pages? You know, some of us are confronted each day with spiritual problems whose solutions others take for granted in much the same way that you or I take for granted our ability to turn pages. It turns out that life's really great battles are fought as we labor each day to muster that quiet courage that it takes to get our spirits just to turn the pages. You know, I'm well into my 30s. In fact, I'm about as well into them as you can get and still be in them. And <clears throat> I've never spent a day in the hospital since I was born that I can remember. My mom is here. She might know better. But my friend Deanne Hoffer will be 22 in a few months, and she spent 14 years in a hospital. Not 14 days, 14 years. In other words, uh, roughly 500 or 5,000 of the roughly 8,000 days that she's been alive have been spent in a hospital. Deanne has one of those motorized wheelchairs, you know, that you see. Hers has only two speeds, fast and move over General Lee. I've only heard her complain once. It was at a ward dance. 
and she asked me to dance one of those fast dances with her. And I thought she was teasing, but I walked a little way out on the dance floor with her, and at that time she reared that wheelchair back in a full wheelie position, and she did the neatest little two-step, or maybe I should say two-wheel, that you've ever seen. You want to know what her complaint was? It was for a guy with two good feet, I didn't dance so well. I think Deanne would admit that her body is pretty much a wreck. 5,000 hours out of 8,000 in a hospital, or days, I mean. But you know what? Her spirit is whole and alive and healthy. She talks to her Heavenly Father and He listens. And she has the courage to get up each day and continue the fight. Maybe you've made a mistake that makes you feel like your spirit has spent 5,000 days in a hospital. You know, it takes courage to fix that kind of wreck. But if Deanne can do it physically, you can do it spiritually. Just one more example, and then I'll conclude. I was serving as bishop of the BYU 36th Ward, as President Balif mentioned. And several years ago, about this time of the year, it was spring term was beginning. And at the conclusion of our first Sunday meetings, a young lady came up to introduce herself to me. She walked with difficulty and with an accentuated stagger. Her facial features were somewhat distorted, and her speech was obviously impaired. And I later learned that Carol had had cerebral palsy as a child and that she'd been left with a severe physical handicap. We visited for a minute, and then she left. And you know what I, as her good bishop, did? I said to myself, here's a girl who's probably going to need a lot of special attention, take up a lot of my time, probably be a burden, maybe on me and on her roommates. Well, that may just be the worst knee-jerk reaction I've ever had. Let me tell you why. A few days later, our ward had an opening social at the King Henry Swimming Pool. And one of our new ward members, who is a big, handsome, six feet of tan body and solid muscle, just like I looked when I was his age, dove off the diving board <laughs> and bumped his head on the bottom of the pool. We didn't seem to bump it very hard, but nevertheless, he got out of the pool and went over and laid out underneath the tree and moaned a little. Now, whether he was really injured or not, uh, I don't know, and it doesn't matter. What matters is that I sat and watched as Carol struggled over to the table where the food was and somehow managed to get some food on a plate and struggled back to the tree where this six-foot mass of moaning muscle was laying and she fed him, and she stayed with him, and she cared for him. Well, you can see I'd worried about Carol being a burden on someone. And Carol baked cookies for people. She took people places in her car. She took care of them when, she, when they were sick. And when she bore her testimony, it was so quiet that you could hear a pin drop. Because her spirit was well, and she had great courage, and she had great faith. One Sunday I announced that the Combined Stakes were planning a five-mile fun run, <clears throat> and since we old men and the bishopric were planning to run, everybody else ought to run too. And Carol decided that if old men could run, she could run. Now, Honestly, to watch Carol, you wouldn't think that she could walk a block, let alone run any place. But she had developed a kind of shuffling gait, and she worked out each day until she said she was sure that she could cover five miles. One day, the day of the run came, and there were about 50 or 60 of us from the ward that showed up, and there was Carol. And we decided that we would assign some ward members to stay with Carol until she got tired, and then they could go back and get the car and pick her up. So the race began, and there were several thousand runners. And after a few blocks, I lost track of Carol and the other members of the ward as well. We ended up—that's one of my members of the ward. I can tell by his laugh. <laughs> it sounded just like Dan Danes. <clears throat> the race ended up uh, 
by having us run in the southeast side of the stadium and around the track to the west stands. And the race had finished and nearly everyone had crossed the finish line and we were standing around in small groups and some people, a lot of people actually, were sitting in the stands. And we were congratulating ourselves on having survived and then we remembered Carol. But no one could remember having seen her and now it was almost half an hour since the last runner had come in and we became alarmed. Well, we walked back to the other side of the track to see if we could look up the road and sure enough, here she came, walking in that staggered gait of hers. And as she walked in the gate and over to the track, she began to jog. You see, she had class. She wanted to finish this race in style. And there were eight or ten of us that had gone over there and we started running with her alongside her, encouraging her and helping her along. Well, we got around the track to where the west stands were and everyone in the whole stadium stood up and started cheering and shouting and yelling encouragement. And she crossed the finish line and we all jumped up and down with her and threw our arms around her and hugged her and congratulated her for the courage that she had shown in finishing that race. Well, Carol had class, and she had courage, and she had style. Her spirit was healthy. Now, my young brothers and sisters, it's not easy for us to overcome our spiritual shortcomings. It's not easy sometimes to cure our spiritual leprosy. It takes determination, and it takes courage. But I know that there are roommates and family members and bishopric members who wait with their arms open to throw them around you as you exhibit the kind of spiritual courage that we saw in Carol that day when we threw our arms around her. Remember Naaman? Naaman followed the counsel of a prophet and his leprosy was cured. We have a prophet today, and if we follow his counsel, we can cure our spiritual leprosy. The ten lepers went to the Savior with their problem. The message is clear. We need seek no other response to our spiritual afflictions. The Savior has bid us to come unto him, for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I so testify to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.